France has just crossed a political Rubicon, President Emmanuel Macron has confirmed that Paris will build a next-generation nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the PANG. On paper, that sounds like one more procurement headline in a world overflowing with them. In reality, this is France making a generational bet on what kind of power it wants to be in the 2040s, and how loudly it intends to speak in crises where distance, time, and access are the real currencies of influence. Start with the blunt strategic fact. France operates a single aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle. It entered service in 2001, and even with upgrades, its clock is running toward retirement in the late 2030s. One carrier is not a carrier capability in the way people imagine it because maintenance cycles are merciless. A single hull means long periods where your carrier power exists mostly as a concept. So when Macron says the program is approved and design work moves into execution, it is not just about replacing metal. It is about preventing a hard gap in France's most visible instrument of expeditionary power. And France, unlike most European states, has built national strategy around the idea that it can act, sometimes with allies, sometimes without waiting for them. Now look at the size, around 78,000 tons. That is not a marginal upgrade, that is a step change. The Charles de Gaulle is roughly half that, and with this jump, France is positioning itself to build the largest warship ever constructed in Europe. Why does tonnage matter beyond prestige? Because deck space, fuel, munitions, maintenance capacity, and aviation support determine how many sorties you can generate and sustain when the situation stops being a show of presence and becomes a real fight. The design points to a flight deck around 17,000 square meters, bigger deck, more parking, more flexibility, more tolerance for chaos. In carrier aviation, space is tempo and tempo is combat power. But the real tell is not the displacement, it is the launch system. The PANG is expected to use three electromagnetic catapults and three advanced arresting gear systems supplied by General Atomics, the same technological family already used by the U.S. Navy's Ford class. That single detail quietly rewrites France's future air wing options. Electromagnetic launch is not just a fancy way to throw aircraft off a deck. It is a power and control problem, and solving it gives you an air wing that can evolve. Heavier next-generation fighters, launchable. Lighter uncrewed aircraft, launchable more gently, with less airframe stress, different weight classes, different mission profiles, different pacing. The carrier stops being optimized for one aircraft generation and becomes a platform designed to adapt. And that matters because France is trying to keep its naval aviation relevant through at least mid-century. Today, the carrier air wing revolves around Rafale M fighters, E-2D Hawkeye airborne early warning aircraft, helicopters, and a growing drone component. Tomorrow, France wants the option to operate its next-generation combat aircraft tied to the future combat air system effort. Whether FKS delivers on time in the exact form envisioned is its own debate, but from a carrier design perspective, you do not build a 78000-ton nuclear platform to fly only what you already have. You build it to host what you cannot yet fully define. New fighters, loyal wingman concepts, uncrewed ISR and strike, and the data-hungry sensors and networks that make modern air power work. The question is not, will it carry drones? The question is, how quickly can France mature naval drone operations into something more than a technological cameo? Then comes the heart of the ship, two new K-22 nuclear reactors, each producing roughly 220 megawatts of electrical power built to support an all-electric architecture and the demands of electromagnetic launch. That's not trivia, it's the foundation. Nuclear propulsion buys endurance and sustained high-speed operations without the logistics tail of conventional fuel but the bigger shift is electrical power as the central resource. Modern carriers are less about steam lines and more about power management, catapults, sensors, defensive systems, communications, and whatever future upgrades arrive, directed energy, advanced radar suites, electronic warfare, everything competes for watts. France is essentially designing a ship that treats electricity as the strategic enabler, not a background utility. If you want a carrier to remain relevant for 40 years, you do not simply design for today's aircraft, you design for tomorrow's power demands. So why is Paris doing this now, beyond the calendar pressure of Charles de Gaulle's retirement window? Because geography has not changed, but France's operating environment has. The Indo-Pacific is no longer a distant abstraction. France has territories, citizens, and exclusive economic zones spread across that region. In Europe, the security order is hardening into something more confrontational and more sustained. And within NATO, the alliance is relearning that deterrence is not a slogan, it is capability you can deploy quickly and credibly. A carrier is not a magic wand and it does not replace land-based air power, but it does something land bases cannot always do. It arrives without requiring permission, it moves as the political and military situation shifts and it can sustain pressure where basing rights are uncertain, contested or simply unavailable.
That autonomy is the key word. France speaks often about strategic autonomy, and critics rightly ask what that means in practice. Here is one answer. A national nuclear-powered carrier with U.S.-grade launch and recovery gear that allows France to operate a modern mixed air wing far from home. It is autonomy through capability, not through rhetoric. Yet there is a paradox embedded in the procurement choices. The launch and arresting systems come from a U.S. firm. Is that dependency or pragmatic interoperability? In a crisis, is it a vulnerability or is it the price of accessing mature technology and aligning with the largest naval aviation ecosystem on Earth? France is not buying an American carrier, but it is clearly choosing to plug into a set of standards that expands options and reduces technological risk. That is not surrendering sovereignty. It is selecting the areas where sovereignty matters most, reactors, hull, combat system integration, and buying what is expensive to reinvent. Of course, the announcement is the easy part. Macron's confirmation signals political commitment, but the timeline reveals how much can still go wrong. Reports suggest a formal construction order before the end of 2025, physical build likely beginning in the early 2030s, and full operational capability targeted around 2038. That is more than a decade of engineering, budgeting, industrial scheduling, and political continuity. How many governments will come and go before the ship is operational? How many economic cycles? How many strategic surprises? Carrier programs are not just technical projects, they are national endurance tests. Then there is the operational reality that people often gloss over. A carrier is not a lone chess piece. It demands escorts, replenishment ships, submarines, maritime patrol support, satellite coverage, trained air crews, maintainers, and a doctrine that treats the carrier as both a strike asset and a defended node in a networked battle space. France already fields a capable blue water navy, but scaling up to a larger carrier with higher sortie potential will stress manpower and fleet structure. A bigger carrier is a bigger promise, but also a bigger bill in training hours, spare parts, and escort readiness. The hard question is not, can France build it? France can build it. The hard question is, can France sustain it at the readiness level required for the missions it imagines? And yet, step back and ask, what is the alternative? Let the Charles de Gaulle retire and accept a decade-long vacuum in carrier aviation? Rely entirely on allies for sea-based air power? For a country that sees itself as a global actor? That is a strategic retreat disguised as budget discipline. The PANG, by contrast, is France staking out a claim that Europe can still build capital ships of the highest complexity, that French nuclear naval expertise remains a strategic asset, and that Paris intends to keep a sovereign option for rapid power projection when diplomacy needs a steel-backed argument. In the end, the most important aspect of this decision is what it signals to everyone watching friends, rivals, and France's own defense industry. France is telling the world it expects a future where maritime air power remains decisive, where access is contested, and where a nation's ability to act independently depends on platforms that can survive political friction and logistical constraints. The PANG is not just a ship, it is a statement about France's tolerance for risk and its appetite for strategic weight. The only remaining question is whether Europe's largest warship will arrive on schedule as a symbol of national resolve, or arrive late as a monument to how hard it is to turn ambition into steel.